I still had a hard time seeing the revelations, the wisdom, the insights of the Word of God because God calls it a mystery. Mystery doesn't mean mysterious. Mystery means this. Welcome to another lesson of Hearing God. I'm so excited about this course. Now, first of all, I want to address why, John, are you on a different set? Well, we had a studio for all the other lessons, but there's two lessons that we felt, our producers felt, that you know we wanted to bring you right into Lisa's in my home. This is actually my office at my house where I spend a lot of time in prayer and, and, and spending time with God. And we thought it would be a really good idea for you to just actually see what it looks like. And so we've already established on a different lesson the authenticity of the scriptures. And it's mind blowing when you think about it, 1500 years over that span, the Bible was written by over 40 writers. And you put it all together in three different languages, by the way, and from three different continents, continents, and you have this book that perfectly harmonizes. Do you know that the Bible is the only, quote, holy book, let's just put it that way, of all religions of the world that was written by many, many different men? So all the other religions of the world, they've got one. And so that shows you, again, how amazing the scriptures are. And when I think about the scriptures, I think one of the last words the Apostle Paul penned on this earth was to his, uh, his protege, Timothy. And he made this statement. I'm jumping ahead of myself, but it's important. Every scripture is God-breathed, given by his inspiration, and profitable for instruction, for reproof, and conviction of sin, for correction of error, and discipline in obedience. Man, that's a mouthful right there, okay? And for training in righteousness, in holy living, in conformity to God's will, in thought, purpose, and action. <laughs> that is huge. Now, let me say this. The Bible written, read without the help of the teacher, the Holy Spirit, is going to bring a lot of confusion. I remember I would read the Bible before I got saved. And to me, it didn't make a lick of sense. It was just a bunch of stories and a bunch of rules and regulations. Then I got saved in January of 1979, but I was not filled with the Holy Spirit until June 3rd, 1979. Those four months, I still struggled. I still had a hard time seeing the revelations, the wisdom, the insights, of the Word of God because God calls it a mystery. Mystery doesn't mean mysterious. Mystery means this. It is something that needs to be unveiled, uncovered, dug up, so to speak. And so it takes the teacher, the Holy Spirit, to open up this book. And so one thing you're going to remember here in, in your walk with God is that the Holy Spirit wants to communicate to you, but he's never going to communicate contrary to this book. Anything he speaks to you, of course there will be things he speaks to you that are outside of the scripture because you, know, you don't find in scripture the name of the person you're gonna marry, although I've seen him use the scripture to help people identify. It's amazing how he did. But the Holy Spirit will never, write this down, big never, all caps, speak contrary to the written word of God. And that is what Paul was saying to Timothy, the very last thing he wrote. Also, Peter writes, he writes this, above all, you must realize that no prophecy in scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or from human initiative. No, these prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. God. So the author of the scripture is not human beings. The author of scripture is God himself. He used instruments. He used men in which he flowed through to speak to us his word. And it's so important because David makes the statement, thy word is a light unto my path. It's a lamp unto my feet. It's a light unto my path. And so I really want to open up here, this lesson, with talking about the fact that all Christians know that we should read the Bible. But here's what's really scary. A lot of us are not reading the Bible. 
Barna did a study in 2018, so this is very recent. 48% of the people that Barna polled, their organization said they were Bible users. So half of the people, 48%, they read it, they listen to it, they watch it, they engage in content in any form, not including church service. So 48%, but, but listen to the stats. 8% use it three to four times a year. The Bible, okay? 6% use it once a month. 8% use it once a week. 13% use it several times per week. And 14% use it daily. So the ones that I would consider to be healthy would be the 13% use it several times a week and the 14% use it daily. So we're talking just 27%, one fourth of the people that are really using the Bible as it should. You say, John, why would you say only them? Why not the people that you know use it once a week or maybe once a month? Well, let me ask you this. I want you to live eating one meal. I'm talking about physical food. You, you actually have a meal where you have your salad, your steak, and your vegetables one meal a week. And you tell me how you're doing in life you wouldn't be able to function properly. You wouldn't think clearly. If you ever had to fight to protect your family, you wouldn't have the strength. So just as physical food to our body is nourishment, the Word of God is nourishment to our spirit. Now, why do we want our spirit to be nourished? Because it gives us a greater capacity of hearing God. If I'm eating one physical meal a week, you know, I've been in situations before where I'm famished, I'm weak, and I can't engage in very important conversations. Everything has to be pretty surface. So this is why you want to keep the Word of God building up your inner man. We are told constantly in the New Testament to build up our inner man. We are a spirit, we have a soul, and we live in a physical body called this earth suit. And, and so I'd like to call it the earth suit. So. Here's, here's a little bit of my background. I was raised in church, and our particular denomination thought we were the only ones going to heaven. I mean, I used to look at all the people at the other churches and thinking, man, they sure are wasting time because our denomination is the only one that's going to heaven. Well, then I got saved in my fraternity in college, and I remember my college offered an extension course from a major university of the denomination I was a part of, and it was an Old Testament survey. And the professor that taught it was renowned. And I remember the first class he stood up and he said, there are 656 contradictions in the Bible. You can't prove that Jesus was raised from the dead from the Bible, although he didn't realize that Josh McDowell set out seven years to disprove Christianity. And after all of his research through scriptures and historic writings and history books, he discovered that God was real, okay? But hey, let's leave it there. And the third thing is he said is when Moses and the children of Israel crossed the Red Sea, it was just a marsh. That was my first class in Theology 175. So then the very next class, the professor came in and said this. He said, 75% of our teachings come from men, 25% from the Bible. I threw up my hands so quick. I said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. We are basing our eternity off of 25% of what the Bible says. He said, yes. He said, 25% comes from our leader of our denomination and 50% from the ecumenical council. And I made up my mind right there in that class. I said, when I read the word of God, I'm going to believe what it says. So in other words, I'm going to believe the Bible whether I understand it or not. That was one of the wisest decisions the Holy Spirit led me in because that is the fear of the Lord. And the Bible says the fear of the Lord is understanding. And that is why, you know, one of the things people have said in reading the 21 books that I've written, they've said, we are amazed at the insight that you get from scriptures that we've read over and over and over. And you point out things we've never seen. I really believe that's because of the fear of the Lord. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of understanding. So what I have done all through my Christian walk is when I read the scripture, even if that scripture seems ridiculously not realistic, <laughs> I just go, I believe that. And do you know that eventually the Holy Spirit shows me 
how that scripture does fit into the rest of the scripture and how it is very important. And so some of the greatest revelations I've received from the Holy Spirit in the Bible have come from some of the hardest scriptures to understand. And that is because I chose to believe first and then the understanding would come. A lot of times I meet millennials especially or any age group nowadays, they're, they're like, we want the why first. Sometimes you have to believe and then you get the why. If we live by, I want the why first, you're gonna have a lot of struggles in this life because that's what faith is. I'm going to believe even when I don't see, even when I don't understand. That's true faith. And so eventually, I came to the point where I started realizing that the way a lot of teachers teach the Bible is they teach it through the lens of their experience. Now, this is so important that you understand this. Do not read what you believe. Rather, believe what you read. Now, listen to those words again. Don't read what you believe when you're reading the Bible. Believe what you read. What do I mean by don't read what you believe? A lot of times we have a colored lens from our experience in the past and we use that as a filter to interpret scripture. I don't. When I read this Bible, I allow the word of God to dictate my experience, not the word of God to be interpreted by my experience. I hope you're understanding what I'm saying because it's very important. And so... Even reading this Bible, I have been saved now. This is really exciting. At the very time of this taping, I've been saved 40 years to this month. It was 40 years ago that I gave my life to Jesus Christ as Lord, Master, and Savior in my fraternity. So think with me. I've been reading this same book for 40 years. Do you know that one of my funnest times of the day, and I am not kidding, you can ask my sons, my wife this, is when I sit down and read this Bible. You say, how can it be that exciting to you when you've read it many times through over the 40 years? It's because every time I sit down to read this book, I say, Holy Spirit, I'm asking you to reveal Jesus to me. Reveal him to me like I've never known him before. And then I can't wait to get in. And I'm gonna share the practicals of that in just a little while. So why is it important to read the scripture? Because it reveals Jesus. The Bible says in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So the scripture reveals Jesus. Jesus actually said this. He said, you search, this is John 5, 39 and 40. You search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. He said, and these are they which testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have have life. So in other words, they wanted their Messiah the way they wanted him to be, not the way he would come. Now that's very important that you understand that. A lot of times people want to create a Jesus that will serve their selfish needs, their selfish wants, their selfish desires, instead of saying, I want to meet the Jesus of the word of the scripture. And, and this is really tricky nowadays. I mean, you can create a Jesus that will He'll give you premarital sex. He'll give you, you know, the ability to get drunk. He'll give you the ability to lie when your back's up against the wall. And he gets it. He understands. He's okay with it. But are you really knowing, and I mean this, knowing, having an intimate relationship with the real Jesus that's seated at the right hand of the Father? No, you're not. You've made up a different Jesus. I remember I was sharing with somebody. Uh, there was a very high-profile businesswoman, and she had come to the particular place. I think it was actually Hawaii, and they were having a big conference at this hotel. And, you know, I had just flown in, and I just wanted to sit in the sun for a few minutes. And I remember I didn't even have a bathing suit on. It was late in the day. I just walked down there with my jeans that I just traveled in and just plopped down in the chair. And this lady comes and sits down in the chair, and she explains why she's there, and she asks me why I'm there, and I tell her I'm there to, to minister. And... And, and um, she started saying all this, all this stuff about God. Oh, well, God is this and God is that and God is this. And I could see right there, this lady doesn't really know the true God that authored these scriptures. And I said to her, I said, do you see that man sitting across the pool? And I pointed to a guy. Her name was, I can't remember her name, but let's just say it was, uh, it was let's just say it was Sherry. 
So, in, so, so I said, Sherry, what if I walked over to that guy over there and said, hey, you see Sherry over there? I want to tell you about her. Sherry is a vegan. Sherry loves synchronized swimming. Sherry loves, you know, um, and I said some other ridiculous things. And I looked at her and her face was getting more contorted every time I said something. And I said, do you understand, Sherry, that I totally misrepresented you to that guy? I said, do you like synchronized swimming? She said, no. I said, are you a vegan? She goes, no. I said, but yet I got that guy to believe you were. So what I did is I shared with him a Sherry that's not the real Sherry. If I would have spent time talking to you, then I could have represented to him the real Sherry. I said, you're telling me all about a God you don't know anything about. I said, have you taken the time to read the Bible and find out how he reveals himself in the word of God? She said, well, you know, I've read it maybe, you know, a couple times in my life. I said, you don't know him. And I said, here you are telling me about a God that is really not the real God. And so this, as believers, we want to be effective communicators of who we know, of who Jesus Christ really is. And so I now want to move into the real practicals of reading scripture. It is really important that we have, I personally, I tried to do this electronically because I do a lot of things. I preach with my iPad. I read the Bible from my phone. I read the Bible from my iPad. But I still like, when it comes to my time alone with the Lord, a physical paper Bible in front of me, okay? Why is that? Because I want to be able to highlight areas that God speaks to me. And usually what I do is I'll try to go through a Bible in a year. Can I tell you, I've only done it once, I think, in my life. And I'm going to tell you there's a reason. There's these, these daily reading Bible programs, right? And people will miss three or four days. And so they'll try to read the three or four days that they missed. And can I tell you, if you miss six or seven meals, let's say you've gone two and a half days without eating, are you going to eat seven different meals? Are you going to have, okay, a steak and, and vegetables and a salad here, and then you're going to have a chicken and your, and your noodles there, and you're going to have over there your lunch, you're going to have over there a couple scrambled eggs, and are you going to sit down and eat seven, seven meals? No. You know what you do? You'd almost kill yourself. And this is, this is what I tell people. Okay, you miss a day. First of all, don't get upset with yourself. I've missed days, okay? Many days. Don't get upset, but don't try to make up yesterday. Just, our goal is not to get through the Bible. Our goal is to hear from God. When we sit down and read, we want the Holy Spirit to reveal Jesus like we've never known him before. So you know there are days that I spend 30 minutes and I haven't even gotten through a chapter, okay? Do I get upset about that? No. So you see, this is the one I'm going through now. And guess what? I've just finished it recently. And um, I think it took me about two years to get through it. Maybe a little over two years. And so, you know, that's the thing. I, I didn't care because I'm not setting a goal. Now, there have been times in the past where I've read the Bible chronologically. I'd say the same thing. If it takes you two years to do that, don't, don't let it upset you. Take the time. Let the scripture be digested into your spirit. You know, when you eat, you don't take one bite and swallow. You chew on it. You meditate. This is When you're reading the scripture, you're meditating on it. You're allowing space for the Holy Spirit to speak to you. So let, let, me, just, let me just show you. This is, this is a New Living Translation. And now that I'm, I'm almost all the way through it the second time, I'm going to probably move to another version because I just like doing that. And why do I do that? Because just as, you know, it's very difficult to translate the Hebrew, the Aramaic, and the Greek into an English language, the very fact that there are several translations, different translators are capturing different emphasis of different verses. So I make sure that I'm going through even paraphrases to get more of a feel of what the Holy Spirit's saying in that scripture. It really opens up things. So 
I had chosen a couple years ago to go through this particular Bible, and this is the New Living. Now, if you come close, you'll find out that, first of all, I have a set of these pens, and I actually, in my drawer, my guys didn't anticipate this, but that, that you know, you can buy these anywhere. You can buy them on Amazon, but these are special pens, okay, that when you open them up and you, and you, and you do it in your Bible, they don't bleed through. So they're actually special ink that... You know, I used to get so frustrated because I highlight something and then I'd turn the page over and I'd be like, oh my gosh. And these don't bleed through. And then I, I find a highlighter also and I use a pencil. So I have all, I have seven different colors of these pens. I think they come in packages of seven, that's why. And blue is what I use to highlight the promises of God or something that's very, very important. Um, I'll use black and... Um, Black is, um, what I do is is uh, cities that are important. Let's say the king's name that's important. And then I have many other different colors. And you can set up your colors however you want. Just figure it out before you start. But let, I just flipped open today to the book of Ephesians. Let's, let's just look at this. Um, I'm looking at chapter 4, verse 11. Now, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. Now, I'm not racing when I read this. I'm absorbing the apostle, the prophet. So I, I, I circle the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastors, and teachers. So I see there's five different ministries. Most of us know that. But look at this next statement, their responsibility. So I highlight their responsibility because that's important. I happen to be one of those five categories, and I want to know what my responsibility is. So I just lost my lid there. So I make sure that I highlighted that because that really spoke to me. John, this is your responsibility. All right, is to equip. So I highlighted the word equip. My, my responsibility is to equip you. I want your time reading the Bible to be equipped so that it's rich, so that you hear from the Holy Spirit, okay? God's people to do the work and build up. So there's the second responsibility, to equip and to build up. So I highlighted both of those, right? The church, the body of Christ, and then you keep going. Now, that's a very important scripture to me, so I highlight it. It's not a promise, so it's not highlighted in blue. If I come over here to the end of chapter four, it says, instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Imitate God. Now, a lot of times people separate the end of the chapter from the next chapter. This is all one thought, and I see it's one thought. So I it's a very important thought. It's not a promise, but it's an important thought. So I highlighted this in blue. If I come over here to Ephesians 6, you'll find out, children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. For this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. So you can see, okay, blue highlight, promise. One day I'm reading my Bible and I realize, oh, I, I've heard so many teachers say the New Testament is not do's and don'ts. The New Testament is all do's. Well, I went through and I counted 11 total don'ts in Ephesians. <laughs> don't be drunk with wine, whereas an excess. Don't uh, steal. Don't lie. Don't be idolaters. Don't be fooled by those, you know, on and on and on. So that was a real revealing moment for me. Now, I actually was planning on reading a different book in the New Testament, and the Holy Spirit said, no, son, I want you to read Revelations. I was just getting ready. I was looking for a book to read. So here's a time where I divert from my normal reading plan. I was going to read a different book in the New Testament, but I felt the Holy Spirit said, read in, book, in the book of Revelations. So even though I had just read it like five months ago, I didn't argue because I've learned when the Holy Spirit interrupts my reading plan like that, it's because he wants to say something to me. Well, I get to the third chapter of Revelations and I get a word for our messenger team for this coming year. And you can see, I'm going to get, I hope you can get this camera close enough. I put 1231.18 and I put a bracket there because that is the word that God gave to the messenger team to me for 2018. And I shared it with our, our New Year's party that we had with our team. And so uh, let, me, let me show you from a different book another way that this has happened with me. In, in 2010, my wife was in England. She was speaking at a conference for women. And I'm just in our basement, and I'm casually reading the book of Daniel. So this, at the time, was, this is the New King James. This was the book I was going through. You can see I got a lot more colorful later. I wasn't so colorful here. But I'm just reading the scripture in Daniel chapter 2. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts 
and he made him ruler over the whole providence. Well, the whole providence jumped up off the page. I mean, literally, it's like a neon light, or I, I shouldn't say literally. It was like a ne neon light went off. It jumps off the page, and the Holy Spirit starts talking to me. And he said, son, you've been faithful with the English-speaking community. I want you now to get your messages into the hands of pastors and leaders in every nation of the world. Now, that was May 31st, 2010. And you can see, I hope you can get that. I circled that and I put 531.10. Well, that was the beginning of our initiative to get our books and resources into the hands of pastors and leaders all over the globe. And now today, it's 2019 that I'm doing this online course. By the grace of God, at this very day, we've been able to get 21.3 million resources into the hands of pastors and leaders in 97 nations in 111 languages. That's mind-blowing, okay? But it all began when the Holy Spirit caused that to jump up off the page. And can I tell you, it's always been in my heart to give books, more books away than we've sold. But the time came when he gave that rhema word. See, rhema means spoken word. Logos means written word. When that rhema word jumped up off the page, that Daniel was promoted over the entire providence, not just a section of, the, of, of Babylon, but the entire nation of Babylon. The Holy Spirit used that scripture to say, I want you to get your books in the hands of pastors and leaders in the whole world. We tried doing this in 2001. We tried giving 100,000 resources to pastors in the underground church in China. And it, I wrote a two, two, I spent two days writing, I think the best partner letter I've ever written before. And I thought, man, this letter makes me want to give. And do you know hardly anybody responded? And that project almost broke us financially. But then God spoke this to me, and now we've given away 21.3 million, million resources. We run a golf and an alpine week here at, at the Broadmoor Hotel in Colorado Springs. Do you know last year, $3 million came in to give books to pastors and leaders in all these nations? And I stand in awe. Here, I was trying to do it without the rhema because it was in my heart. But then when God gave me the rhema, now all of a sudden, I've had team members just look at me and shake their hands and go, a golf tournament bringing in $2 million to give to pastors all over the world? Who's ever heard of such a thing? I haven't. Only the grace of God could do this. But you see, this is why Paul said, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. Did you just hear that? Paul the Apostle said to the Ephesian elders, and now I commend you to God, not just God, he didn't stop there, and to the word of his grace. In other words, this word empowers us to do what we couldn't do in our own ability. When the Holy Spirit breathes on it, now we have understanding that we never could have gotten on our own. We have revelation we could never get on our own. We have wisdom and insight we never could have gotten on our own. We have the ability to give 21.3 million resources to pastors and leaders all over the world. We could have never done that in our own ability. It almost broke me 10 years earlier. This is what happens when you start reading the scripture. See, if you're in the marketplace, you're a businessman, businesswoman, you'll be reading and all of a sudden a scripture will jump up off the page. Now all of a sudden God just gave you an inspired idea for a new revenue stream, a new business, maybe a new investment. He'll do this. So why aren't we reading the Bible? Why is only 27% of us reading it at least multiple times in a week? It's because we don't understand. And this is the way I look at it also because so many times the Holy Spirit, he'll bring up a scripture I haven't read in months, but this is the way I like to say it, okay? Pretend I'm a dental assistant and I put out the, the, you know, the knife, the scraper, the, the, the shot of Novocaine, and I put all the tools out. Then you know what happens? The dentist comes in and says, give me the Novocaine shot, boom. Okay, the Holy Spirit's like the dentist. If we're reading the word, all of a sudden he can pull that and speak to us. You know, uh, Lisa and I are in the process right now of building a house. And uh, it's something that God really put in my heart to do for this next phase. And I remember, you know, I, I, I got a little anxious midway through. And I remember the Holy Spirit spoke to me 
a scripture I hadn't read in probably nine months. All of a sudden, the scripture comes bubbling up, having begun in the spirit, are you now gonna be made perfect by the flesh? And I thought, wow, this whole thing started by the spirit of God, why am I now being anxious? See, he had tools to pull from. That's why I can't emphasize enough, it's so important to hear God that you spend time in the word of God. And I believe that this lesson is so valuable practically for you because I don't want you under pressure. Man, oh man, I didn't read my four chapters today. I don't care if you just read four verses. If the Holy Spirit spoke to you out of those four verses, you got more than the person that read three entire books of the Bible without getting a thing. So remember, it's not quantity, it's quality. Allow him to reveal himself to you in the scripture.